kick it off for, with our next session and our next guest. Uh, it is Amir Jafari from Shopify. Hey, Amir. Nice to see you again. So, you know, him and I both live in Toronto, Canada. Uh, we literally know, I don't know, like a million people between us. But somehow, I have no idea how this has happened. We've never met. And Amir's also been like a longtime customer of ours. And I recently had the chance to be connected with him. First conversation just completely blew me away. One of the smartest people I've met and so, so humble. You know, I'm pretty active on Twitter and there's like a lot of, let's just say, self-congratulatory people uh, on Twitter. Everyone's like patting their own backs. Um, and a lot of them are patting their own backs and they have done something cool and amazing. And a lot of them just haven't. And Amir is just like one of those like humble people that you come across in your lifetime and you're just like, holy shit, this guy is smart and super under the radar. I don't know if it's by design or what. And he's got like 10 different side projects going on, all of them very cool. I don't even know like how to properly introduce him because he's like multi-talented, has just done all this cool stuff and has innovated on how this um, sort of creative team is set up at Shopify. So I think a lot of what we're going to talk about today is how do you balance, quality, scale, output, all of that stuff. How do you um, work closely with your marketing counterparts, uh, you know, by evolving how you're set up, your organizational design and having some good frameworks and rituals in place? Yeah, I, we'd love to just like kick it off with tell us what your role is at Shopify and what is this thing called Creative Workshop? Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I work at Shopify. I uh, past couple of years, I've focused on creating something called the Creative Workshop. And that came out of the fact that we were growing really fast and our creative capacities didn't match the need we had for both all the platforms we had to be on. And we had to figure out how to make creatives that perform on all these different platforms with all the different optimizations and best practices. And then also scaling it to all the different languages, different types of people who would use Shopify, which is a very wide spectrum of people, and also the different uh, business verticals that we service. So we had to really rethink how we organize a creative team, match them with performance marketers, organic uh, marketers, because we had to create everything from webinars, which is you know one piece of video that you spend a lot of time doing down to Facebook ads that you need to refresh every couple of weeks and uh, do it in multiple languages and take uh, certain best practices and bake them in. So Creative Workshop was really rethinking how we organize as a growth and creative team to solve all these new problems we had. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. Um, before we jump into how the team is actually set up, let me just ask you a question. Um, Shopify's, I mean, from the outside, Shopify's main message seems to be to online retailers, which is your main audience. Um, your main message seems to be, hey, build your brand from scratch from day one. Don't rely on whatever it is, right? Like the Amazons of the world, because that's not a great brand building opportunity for you. You need your own website, your own brand. You need to control your own experience, et cetera, right? Like that's sort of the main message, I, I would say. Yeah. Well, I think that, yeah, exactly. I think a lot of it is our audience is pretty much anybody who has an ambition to become an entrepreneur. And Shopify is pretty much the platform that gives you the tools to take action on your ambition to become an entrepreneur. And the beauty of it is you can set up all kinds of business models. So if you're a YouTuber, you can sell merch. If you are a designer, you can create your designs on merchandise and have the same business model as a YouTuber, but you're monetizing your design skills. If you are a crafter and make, you know, pottery or handcraft goods, you can sell those. If you're an Amazon seller, you can still install the Amazon channel on Shopify and still be active on Amazon, on Etsy, on all these different places but use Shopify as your main hub for organizing all your business activities to manage all these different channels. So we take a pretty agnostic way of like how you want to run your business. Um, our focus is making sure you have the best shot at succeeding by giving you all the tools and education you need to go about it. Yeah, that makes sense. So given the nature of your mission, um, I'm curious, how is the... I guess maybe two part question. First question is how much power, uh, power is maybe not the greatest word, but I guess how empowered is the creative team at Shopify to make uh, big decisions and how proactive are they uh, today? 
Yeah, and that that's a great question. And that was one of the big things we had to kind of take into account when we were doing the um, thinking about creative workshop was really making the designers and the creative team an active participant in not just how we do stuff, because before that's where they had the most influence. They would get a brief, like this is what we want, and they would figure out how to execute it. But even what, what to focus on, what's the problem we want to solve and how we should go about it. And that's where uh, we made a big change. And designers not only became the executors of the creative vision, but also an active participant in defining the problem and uh, deciding where are the best places that we can leverage their skill sets, which is producing creatives uh, and which surfaces they should go after. So they're equal partners in all the steps. Nice. That makes so much sense. I know you have a couple of slides to walk us through, but again, just before we jump into that, how is the design or creative team set up? Like, is it fully centralized? Like there's like one massive team and they service all these different parts of the organization and, you know, work with them collaboratively. Yeah. So that's uh, the other thing we changed is for growth side of things. One thing that's different with the creative asks is that usually we don't want one-off creatives. If we are doing, you know, a ca campaign or a big TV ad or a poster or billboards, or uh, we are creating graphics for an eBooks or something, these are things that you create once and you ship it and you're happy with it. For growth, you usually need iteration over an idea to get better at solving it. And for those, you need designers to build their muscle at solving those specific problems. So they don't have an intake form, this group, the creative workshop. They pick the problems they want to solve, and that problem becomes the focus that they're going to ship multiple variations of the creative, go about it a variety of different ways, experiment on different executions to find a solution. And once they find a solution, then we go about, okay, do we need to constantly own this problem, or are there tooling, resources, uh, processes that we can implement that the next time we want to service this need or scale it to other areas of the business or languages, it's not as resource in intensive. That sounds like such a sort of, I mean, modern approach, but also just kind of like, I, I almost feel like not every org is going to have the appetite for that to some degree. Is Were there certain uh, preconditions that like was like what was so conducive about the environment of Shopify that you were able to make this change? Uh, the good thing about Shopify is like you, you the Shopify allows you to focus on solving the problem and coming up with the solution uh, that matches the problem. So they're not really focused on you know this is how we've always done it or this is the best practice or this is how we did it in another company. It's really taking a realistic look at the problem, identifying, you know, what are the bottlenecks? What are the things that make it so hard? And really, if you can make the case that my solution is speaks to the real problems that stops us from um, doing it, then you have a pretty open hand to experiment with it. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, then you got to figure out another solution. So that, that was the great thing that we just, I just had an idea for the creative workshop because we were frustrated with the pace of production and the quality of the pr production before that, that made the other solution not as attractive. So it was pretty easy to convince them to give this a try. And why did you end up calling it Creative Workshop? Why not just creative or design? Well, that's a great question too. One, because it's kind of vague, which is gives you an open hand. <laughs> so that oh, was good. Workshop just lets you do whatever because it's a workshop. <laughs> like you know, expectations uh, are pretty low. It's a workshop. Branding, it's not internal, about... internal branding and uh, marketing, I guess. Exactly. And the other part of it is I wanted to highlight that it's an experimental uh, focused team. And workshop, I thought, gives you that uh, sense of that you're trying out different things and you have to be somewhat nimble and scrappy and speed and scale matter just as much as quality because i think initially every creative team when they talk about quality they kind of make it synonymous with production quality what's the quality of the camera how good is the coloring audio engineering which are important but there's a lot more to quality than just production quality and i think workshop having creative plus workshop gives uh, that um, founding principle of uh, focusing on not just production quality, but performance and iteration. Yeah, agreed. Um, if you, in the audience, if you are a creative leader or a design ops or a creative ops person, 
guys, this, this session is going to be amazing for you. I feel like in five minutes, we've already covered so much and some of this might've flown over your head. So I'm going to get Amir to just show a couple of slides from his presentation, just so it sinks in a bit more. Uh, but quickly, just to summarize, Shopify had a, uh, just like many other companies had a problem where like, you know, various constituents and stakeholders weren't happy with the, the pace of creative uh, in particular, of course, other issues as well, but particularly the pace. And they've come up with this innovative solution to help scale that uh, and keep things on track. And Amir is basically sharing with us how they came to those conclusions, how their team operates, what are their frameworks, uh, et cetera. So, so take notes because you can go ahead and um, apply this at your organization, particularly if it's complex and multifaceted like Shopify. Uh, Amir, do you want to just uh, maybe share... Yeah, if you could share your screen and your presentation, we'll just run through a few slides and I'll just keep peppering you with questions as you as you walk the, the audience through this. Uh, reminder, everybody, please ask your questions in real time. You don't have to wait till the end. As they come in, I'm looking at them, Cass is looking at them and we're gonna pick like the best, uh, most amazing questions to ask Amir. So, so don't hesitate, please. Sounds good. Yeah, so this, uh, uh, as I was saying at the start of the session, um, Amir has a lot of different side sort of projects or side hustles, I guess now how sometimes it's referred to. Um, I guess like what's fascinating about that, and I'm, I'm curious to see in chat how you all feel about it. I feel that when you're a creative in particular, that the absence of a side project or side hustle is almost like a weird yellow flag. Um, tell me in chat, how do you feel about that? Is that is that like a good thing, a bad thing? Does that take away from your actual quote unquote job? Um, how do people feel about this, um, this idea of having a lot of different side projects? Sorry, was that a question for me? I was away. No, no, I was just asking the audience. <laughs> how do people feel about uh, side projects? Marcy says, need a side hustle to stay creative, right? Yeah. 100% and not get burnt out. Or it could burn you out if you have too many side hustles, except not, not this guy over here, but uh, certainly some people. Uh, anybody else with an opinion on this? Okay, not a lot or people are being shy. Mike Drummond says, so many times it means I get to play with something different. Yeah, man, exactly. Uh, Nero says helps find inspiration. Absolutely. Corey always be making. Yeah. Yes. Monica says a side hustle lets you do what you want and push boundaries without pushback from teams. Such a good point, Monica. I, I feel that not just the pushback, but like the, there's no guardrails, right? Like the only guardrails are like the ones that you give yourself. So yeah, absolutely. You can like really stretch and let things be serendipitous and flow. So I think that's uh, an excellent point, Monica. Um, anyway, Amir, so since you're back, you can uh, go ahead and share your screens and we'll, we'll, keep, uh, we'll keep chatting. Well, I'm Amir. I uh, lead the growth workshop team at Shopify. Creative Workshop is part of the growth workshop. And uh, going to talk a little bit about how to get marketing and design aligned uh, to create performant ads at scale across different platforms, different languages, and organizing a creative team with the growth team to achieve that. Um, one of the big things that I learned going through this process is there are two parts to the problem of creating a creative at such a scale. It's like one part you want to create creative that has quality. And by quality, I mean, it does the objective that you want, not just production quality, but when you create a webinar, you want people to watch it and become leads and learn about your product to the extent that they take a certain action, then that's the goal. And whatever production quality that lends itself to that, that's what I mean by quality. And the other part is scale. So if you create you know, a phenomenal Facebook video and it does a really good job, but it took you a month to do it and you can't quickly build on that win to do more of that, then it's not very exciting because you spend all your time to do one beautiful piece of uh, video that you probably can't repeat its success. So it's more like a personal art project rather than a uh, creative solution. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to get that scale once you have a win um, with a creative and you have done some learnings. 
Um, the one piece that didn't fit anywhere, but I thought it's probably one of the most important things that I, we kind of learned going through this is defining the creative problem too. Because a lot of times when teams go about producing creative, they get so excited about the production. How is it going to look? How is it going to start? How is it going to end? What's the color scheme? What's the uh, script? All that stuff. But there's a lot of uh, other pieces and steps to defining the creative problem um, beside the production. In fact, the production comes at the end. So the way I um, kind of break it down is at, before you even think about producing, it's always good to understand what's the narrative that you want the creative to drive. And that comes from the assumptions you're making about the audience and the problem you have. Usually you have a certain action you want people to take, whether it's to share a video or become a customer. And based on what's preventing them from taking that action, you have to figure out what are the narratives. And a good way to think about it is thinking that you had like a, a travel agency and you wanted to convince people to buy a ticket to a certain country. Now, some people want to go there for tourist attractions. Some people want to go for um, sightseeing. Some people want to go for excursions. These are all different narratives and connect to different people. So at first, you really got to be very clear about your audience and the assumptions you're making about them on how they're going to get motivated to take that action. Once you figure that out, then you want to go and figure out what's the format of the creative. And the format is once you have the narrative, of, you know, you want to go this direction or that, then you want to experiment with, should we do, you know, a full out cinematic video? Is it a motion ad? Is it a static ad? Which platform is it going to be? Uh, and the, the container that you're going to create this creative in. Once you figure that out, then you can do all the testing of tweaking different parts of the video. Okay, we started it this way. Maybe we should do it that way. Maybe we had a video that the pacing was slow. Maybe we should speed it up or slow it down. Uh, maybe it was the tone of the video or the actors or the scene, uh, scenes that we show or the call to action showed up at the end. Maybe we show it in the beginning. Those are the, all the things that you should focus on after you have already solidified that we have the right assumptions about the audience. We have the right format. Now fine tune the execution. And if you do all of that, then you have one good video or creative asset. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, I totally, I love that. And I love the analogy you used as well. <laughs> I love all the palm trees also. Yes. The palm trees is the only icon I could find enough variations for. Uh, <laughs> cool. And then the biggest um, and most exciting part, at least for me, is the experimentation loop. So now you have kind of defined the problem. You have some semi-working solutions. So it kind of does the job, but not as good. So maybe you have creatives that perform, but they don't have as high of a click-through rate or a cost per action is too high uh, or the engagement is too low. And that's something you can solve a lot with rapid experimentation. And for experimentation, you want to have the creative concept that is pretty much your best guess at solving that problem. Then you go about production. And then in the production, you want to be able to have these platform optimizations based in. And I think that's one of the big things that we wanted to solve with Creative Workshop was that the producers were so sharply divorced from platform optimizations. They were focused on producing a good video or good creative, but they were not as um, up to date with the platform best practices or learnings that we have had from pre previous creatives. And it's not something you can capture in a Google Doc. Like, you know, the marketers can't write a Google Doc and say, always start a video this way, make sure it's this long. Like, it, it's too simplistic to look at it that way. They have to be equal partners in the learnings and as invested in how the creative performed, because after that, you want them to look at the data to see how it performed and come up with some ideas of how, where the creative failed, where did it succeed, and how can it inform the next iteration, which you go back to the creative concept and come up with a new concept to do, go through this whole process again. And that's how you compound learnings. Let me and, let me end this yeah. uh, here. So so you're so to summarize, you're saying um, in order for the creative or the producer to become a subject matter expert, that they need to be part of that entire optimization and iteration process. And yes. not just like the marketer figures that out and then takes it back to the creative and says, hey, do this. Exactly. That that's a broken system because right. it's a telephone game. 
And the other part of it is the creatives don't feel as invested in the outcome either. Because right. I think the most powerful thing about this process is as a creative person, you see the impact of your decisions that you make in the production. So if you decided to start a video a certain way, if you decided to choose a certain color palette and there was not enough contrast between your title and the background, and then you did an iteration when there was enough contrast and that resulted in a better click-through rate, it's a pretty good experience as a designer to say, I made a decision and it had a clear outcome. I wonder what else I can do. And that that's, I think, the energy you want to create in that creative team to feel they are very important and they are a uh, part of the improvement and wins that you get out of uh, good creative production. Such a good, and, such a good point. Yeah. I, I also want to ask about hiring in general. Would you recommend looking to hire creatives that have some channel expertise? Like I'll give you an example. So our, um, our creative director on the marketing team at Superside, he is uh, pretty well versed with YouTube in particular and he knows he generally knows like what kind of formats tend to work through past experience etc right like oh you need a hook yeah. okay it needs to be three seconds like whatever it is like he knows all of that so marketing doesn't have to go experiment and teach the creatives he already knows that how do you yeah. how do you balance that I love that. I mean, that's a very strong set of skill sets that the creative person can also bring that to the table. Uh, at the same time, it's very hard to find that because it's a new thing, uh, this whole model of creative people who produce the assets being very well in tuned with all these other steps of the process, which is platform optimization and analysis and iteration. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that would be ideal scenario. But I think if a creative person doesn't have that skill set, at the same time, they are excited about iterative work and problem solving rather than, uh, you know, just shipping a task and then focusing on a completely different one the next time. Uh, that would be good enough. I think they will be a great player on a team like this and the, the ramping up that skill set doesn't take that long. Right. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. So before the creative team focused on the concept and production, they would get a brief they would come up with a concept and then they would produce it and the growth team would run it and they would say, okay, worked or not. And then they would write another brief and the creative team would do it. And nobody really owned the middle part, which was platform optimization because the creative team didn't do it. The growth team couldn't do it because they didn't produce the video. So that always lived in this little document that moved through the brief creative brief process. And it's kind of like a telephone game. Like you can write what you want, but once a creative person reads it, they might not understand it or take it the same way. And it's not as uh, close to them. So it would never really materialize in the process, uh, iterative process. So creative workshop just puts all of it together, creates the team. They work as one team. So you can think of it as a product team and their product is the creative and the problem they're solving is whatever the uh, 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 creative is trying to solve. And it keeps doing iterations until we see improvement on the metrics that we look at. So a lot uh, like a lot like a growth team, um, like a modern day growth team, where you have UX people, product managers, designers, and um, engineers all working together. And you've basically kind of taken that ethos and brought it to marketing and design, which I love. This is so simple and, and kind of obvious in retrospect, and it's kind of blowing my mind. It's really cool. <laughs> Exactly. Like once you do it, you're like, why would you do it anywhere else? And people are yeah. more excited about doing it because they see the impact of decisions they make in the result. And I yeah. think that's probably the one part that I felt the most uh, upset about was when creative people spend so much time producing these things and they don't see how much you know the impact they can have by just making a tweak here and there and how it translates into all these different platforms. So th that I think it was the biggest uh, benefit of this process is creative people are way more invested in the outcome. Yeah, yeah. The investment um, goes up exponentially. I fully agree. Uh, there is a, or maybe you haven't come across, but I, I, I think there are definitely creatives that want the insight, but in a weird way, they also kind of just want to be told like what, you want and what to do. Have you come yeah. across creatives like yeah. that? Yeah. Do do that? I, I think that's the, the real thing is like, nobody knows 
right? Like nobody really knows. Like even if the person who it's like growth marketer writes a brief, they don't really know what they need. Nobody yeah. knows. Like that. That's why we need the experimentation. And I think as long as you keep experimentation as the subject line, everybody's a little bit humble about their assumptions. Mm -hmm. Strong opinions, loosely held. Nobody knows. Anybody's guess is as good as the other person until we run it and see how it works out. And then maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. It doesn't really matter, but it informs the next batch. So once you do it a few times, then you have some real assumptions and some real best practices that is uh, identified by the process. Because even yeah. best practices that someone writes a blog post about, it's a very hard thing to implement and get the same result because whatever blog post you read, it's contained within a certain company and assumptions and audiences. So I'm not a big fan of uh, solidified best practices right. uh, beforehand. Like one experiment gives you better results than an unlimited number of blog posts you can read. Yeah, hundred percent. That's um, yeah, that's a, that's a good insight. I, I guess just going back to my original question, like when you encounter a creative who's like, just tell me what you want or what you want me to do. What do you? How do you? How do you enlighten them that there's a better way? What What do you say? Yeah, I I I, we ha I have a bunch of uh, different creatives that I've all like. That's how I started creative workshop. I'm like, let's play a game. I'm gonna show you five, six different ads, and we're gonna guess which one performed the best. Right. And once we go through that, you'll see that nobody can really guess which one performs the best. And I think that's a good aha moment that this is where we're starting. This is how far we are and how not equipped we are to guess upfront what we need. So let's come up with the most obvious things we need to figure out, which is assumptions, things we need to solve for and start from a safe bet. That we're like, okay, we know this is the audience. This is the narrative. Mm. Let's just make a bunch of different variations, completely divergent executions of this idea and see how it works. And based on its performance, then we come up with new ideas. Yeah. So, it, I, and I think that gives them some, uh, like, cause like everybody hates vagueness. It's like, give me specific things that you want me to do. And I think by telling them, nobody knows, but your guess is as good as mine. Let's yeah. just do it together. Sets the right uh, structure that they're not as uh, nervous about having all the answers up front. Makes sense. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, so this is the hard part about creative is, you know, there's all these third party platforms that your creative goes on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, Pinterest, Google ads, even. And, and then you have to align brand, the objective you have, and you have to have measurement, which is also hard because each of these platforms gives you different kinds of data. They choose what they define, like Facebook calls a view, a three second view, Facebook calls it a 30 second view is a view. So even their vocabulary is not something you can kind of use interchangeably. Uh, and you have to figure all of that out and then figure out something that works, which is quality, and then be able to scale it. So it's pretty hard. And each of them is kind of different. You know, on Instagram, you have specific types of creative containers. For YouTube, you have different things. For Facebook, different things. Even Google Ads, you know, it's uh, copywriting. Uh, beside, obviously, figuring out the keywords you want to bid on and all that. But there's an art to it as well. So figuring out all of these, building the muscle to understand them and iterate and execute on these takes time. But the best way to do it is to build features. So building each of these products that you're building for Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and I call them products because they're a bundle of features, whether you're intentional about them or not, when you, how you start a video. And if you have a learning and you apply it to all the future videos you make, that's a feature, creative feature that you have learned from experimentation that you carry over to other platforms or the next iteration you're creative. And that's uh, the outcome that you want from all these experiments is to identify features that lend themselves to your performance. Um, so this is the process that we went for like one of the videos. So at, we, we were producing a bunch of Facebook videos. One of them was this very short video that showed five entrepreneurs who started their business after 40. So the narrative was kind of identified. The audience that we wanted to go after was identified, but like, how do you tell that story? It's five people that we want to show their face and say, this is how they started their business. It's very simple. It's probably one of the most simple videos you can make on Facebook, but there are so many different ways you can make it. 
And we looked at the funnel for creative consumption because everybody has a funnel for people who come to their website. They're like, okay, someone lands on the page, clicks on the sign up, fills the form, adds their payment info, becomes a customer. That's a normal funnel. But if you think about it, creative also has a funnel. First, it has to reach you, right? Like it has to show up in your feed, has a uh, load up in your feed. Now, does it get your attention or not? That's a different thing. So view. So if you scroll through Facebook and pause on a video and it plays a little bit, that's an intentional action compared to reach, which you didn't really participate in. Facebook decided to load it up in your feed. And if you view it, do you stick around? Is there engagement? And you can define what engagement is. If they watch 30 seconds, if they watch 15, 15 seconds, if they like it or whatever. And then if it's a longer video, like a YouTube video, you wanna maybe even add another step, which is retention. That means they watch it for an extended period of time, like they consumed majority of the content. And then did they take the action that you want, which is maybe a subscribe to a YouTube channel, share a Facebook post, click through a post, uh, check your profile or follow you, whatever the action is. Just make sure you have very intentional breakdown of all these steps. And for each two steps, you have a drop off in between. So you reach a million people, but only 500,000 of them view it, which is actually a really good rate. But let's pretend that's what you have. So you're like, okay, that's the baseline I'm starting with. I have a 50% drop off between the reach and view. What are the things that prevent someone from not viewing my content? And then you can ideate around building features to solve that. If your YouTube video is a little bit too boring and a lot of people leave after watching 30 seconds of it, you're like, well, what can we do at 30 seconds to kind of get over that hump? And that can be a creative execution as well. If your call to action is not very clear and not that many people are clicking on it, how can you improve that? And then maybe you can say, well, we move the call to action in the beginning, we make it more bold and uh, we show it uh, more prominently, whatever it is, you are focused on solving the drop off between retention and action. So being up very upfront and uh, intentional about which part of the funnel you're trying to solve is the first step. And then figuring out the metrics based on the platform that you're working on that uh, you can measure these uh, milestones with. So you have impressions or reach on Facebook, then you have three second view, 10 second view, 30 second view, share, click, subscribe, whatever you want. Just make sure you know what are the metrics you're gonna look at to decide if your creative execution was successful or not. And this is the other way to think about goal signals metrics because it's easy to um, uh, conflate them. Uh, the goal is what you want to happen at the end of the days. Then the signals are uh, before you get too deep into the KPIs that the platform give you, because Facebook decides what KPIs they give you. Before you get too caught up in 10 seconds view, 30 seconds view, you just want to have a very objective view of what's the signal. If this is true, if this problem that we have gets solved, where would I see the signal? Uh, I see it in the number of shares. I see it in the, click, the number of people who click through it. And then you can go through the metrics that are available on the platform and see which one of them corresponds the most with the signals you're looking at. And that becomes your uh, optimization. So a, a lot of the problems you're focusing on, that becomes the point of discussion of how do we increase the uh, people who watch 30 seconds but don't watch a minute? How do we increase the number of people who view our ad but don't click on it? And that's uh, the core of your uh, workflow for that experimentation cycle. So for example, we had this video, which was five entrepreneurs who started after 40, it just slides through five of them. And we did a bunch of different uh, formats, variations, dimensions, colors, all these different iterations. And with each of them, we picked up a feature that improved each part of the funnel. Some of the features after we did experimentation, we were like, okay, this dimension gives you better view rate. This uh, spacing of the video gives you more watch time. Uh, if we show the link this way, you get better click-through rate. So after all of these, we landed on this format. And this one worked 33 times more views with the same paid budget, 90 times more shares, 65 times more comments, and 120 times more shares. So same concept, same script, just a different execution through experimentation. 
and what was the features that we did learn from all of these uh, different experimentation was compared to the first version of the video, we learned about 14 new features. So all these features are solid learnings that after experimentation, we are like, this does make a difference. Let's make sure in the next version we add it and then focus on another feature. So compared to the first version of the video, for example, for this specific piece, we're like, okay, if you add a box border, it stands out more in feed. We usually see a better uh, view, a reach to view rate. If it's one to one rate, we get better performance. Um, the con the thumbnail contrast uh, compared to the first video, we didn't have that much contrast. We're like a black and white photo actually seemed to work better because the text stood out and people had a reason to watch it. How should be the pacing between each of the slides? Is it too fast, too slow? The transitions the post title, the overlay over images. So no matter what image you put, there's a contrast. There's a very subtle overlay over the images. Number titles, so you can put one, two, three, and then people can see which one they're at. Showing faces in the thumbnails, all these different things added up to turn the same video into this, which performed about 65 times better. And that's just quality. So if we do all of that, we get one good video which is that personal art project, which is great, but you know, you do it once and doesn't really mean anything if you can't build on top of it. Because if you build, if you have a win, it's really a win if you can scale that win and do it multiple times and distribute all the learnings of it to every other problem, similar problem you have in your space, whether it's different platforms, different languages, different types of content. So the next part is really about how to scale the quality. Amir, can I can I just interject and just ask you a couple sure. of questions? Uh, if you just go back to that previous slide, I love that I took a screenshot of it. Uh, it's so smart. Um, I guess what a lot of us struggle with is what order of experiments do you run? Because like the, you've yeah. clearly experimented with a lot. I'm guessing some of this is like known, right? You know, okay, box border is probably going to work because maybe you've done it before. So there's probably some that you're like, yeah. let's try these like five things that we know have worked in the past, but then a lot of it's probably new. So yeah. what is the uh, order? order of problem. Yeah. So first thing is like, have your baseline execution. So the first video or first creative that you launch, you just want to get some baseline performance. Okay, this many people reach, view, click, whatever. Then you look at where the biggest drop-offs are. Where do you lose the most number of people? And which one of them do you have a good confidence that you can actually make a dent in? So when we ran this, we were like, we do lose a lot of people who don't even watch it. So what, and people who don't watch it, I'm not going to spend my time trying to optimize like 15 seconds in the video because they don't even get that far. So all the variables that I can play around with is the thumbnail, the, how the first few seconds of the video show up, the post description, the comments, all that. So that kind of limits the scope of where you're going to focus on in the beginning. And each step, you want to figure out the next biggest drop off and the next most likely place you feel confident that you have an idea that can make a dent. It's kind of like an opportunity sizing where you do impact, confidence, and the effort that needs to solve for that. Gotcha. Yeah, makes sense. Um, also, one other related question. Uh, do you um, suggest that people not only optimize for whatever it is, like the metric, I love the, your KPI uh, thing, like, you know, whether it's reach or retention or what have you, do you recommend that once you crack reach, then you go down the funnel and say, okay, now I'm going to optimize for retention or conversion or whatever it is? Like, it, again, is there like a method to that madness? Right. Not really, because you want to just figure out biggest drop-offs because sometimes, you know, it's like at the end of the day, all these conversions, it's a funnel, right? Like you have 20% who watch this, 10% who do that, 5% who do that, and all, and your end result is a multiplication of all these numbers. So it's like, if you lose 50%, then you have only 50%, and then 25% of them do the next action, 10% of them do the next action. So my rule of thumb is like, which one can you double? Which one do you think, if you really spend your time, you can double the number of people to take the next action? Yeah. And usually that's the one that I have the biggest drop off. I'm like, we're really doing terrible at reach to view, which is great because I think I can double that number because you've done no effort. And then after that, I'm like, okay, what's the next place in the funnel that I can kind of have the best shot at really driving up the number? Right, okay. And the creative person, the designer working on this, go like can say like hey like i guess ugh, you know what i struggle with or what i am struggling with in this yeah. is like 
who act who actually says we should like does the team decide is there consensus on the entire team as to like what you're going to optimize for yeah so we are always optimizing for the uh, uh, objective of the creative so we are the goal of the creative is to get this audience to get be excited enough to go to our website and maybe sometimes maybe part of, a lot of times the goal of the creative a lot of times is just like the most heavy lifting it can do is to get the right people to the site and then it's the job of the site to do the, get them to convert but sometimes you're like okay for a youtube video we also have a lot of opportunity to educate people so by the time they get to the website they can do uh they're more likely to take the action but once you run the creative the first iteration of your video all the growth marketers creative people sit and look at the data together and analyze it and identify opportunities so it's more of a brainstorm against the problem once you have the face the first baseline numbers that you look at it we make assumptions well we lost 50 percent in the beginning and the rest of the video we lost another 30 percent now maybe you come and say well i i, I kind of have a good idea of why we are losing 30 percent in the second half and i think if we do this that's going to really change the numbers. I have no idea about the big number of people we lose in the beginning. And that would be a, the, the ideation process. And everybody contributes with the idea that I think if we do this, we can see a big jump. And you just rank these ideas that you have and uh, first figure out which part of the, the funnel you want to focus on. So we're like, okay, let's focus on the beginning of the part, the beginning the, where we have a big drop off. Great. Now that we have kind of narrowed the scope, let's come up with all kinds of ideas. What can we do to get more people engaged in the first three seconds? Someone can say we do border boxes, we can do the pacing, we can do contrast, all of these. And all of these become experiments. So we usually end up running all of them. Right. It's just a matter of like for Facebook, it's pretty easy. All these executions for YouTube is a little bit more heavy uh, in terms of production. So those we're a little bit more... Uh, uh, careful about which ideas we choose we are like okay does doing this really make a difference do we feel confident or not what is the real problem that's stopping people is it because it doesn't have contrast or is it because people don't even know what this is okay if people don't know what this is what are the ways that we can tell them the reason to watch this very quickly mm. maybe we can increase the title size so or maybe simplify it or maybe do a better job at writing a enticing headline for the video so as long as you find the problem, then you can come up with a bunch of creative ideas against that problem. Yeah, I love this so much. I feel like uh, you can add to your list of side projects that you could just be like a consultant to orgs to like go implement this process and like this, you know, this yeah. sort of <laughs> this cadence. You, you, yeah. you, you would make a lot of money because yeah. everybody needs this. I, I mean, I'm seeing a need for this at Superside. So I'm sure like a lot of people are as well. Yeah, it's, uh, and it's, I think the best part of it is like designers, enjoy the work more too yeah so i could cool. see that cool quality Scaling quality which is uh the other hard part and this has a lot to do with process and tooling because producing a lot quickly is hard because production is hard it takes a lot of time and effort so if we wanted the same video in different colors and each time that we wanted to change the colors it took just as much time that's not a good idea. So my rule for scaling is if you've already done something, next time it should take less time. And if it doesn't, that's an opportunity to figure out, is it a process that can solve that? Is it tooling? Is it workflow? Find all these opportunities that every time you do it takes as much time, then try to figure out how to make it less time. So we have, uh, you know, basic ads like this, you know, it's like a Shopify logo, start your online store with some form of a uh, visual of a computer or a website. And if you want to run that simple ad, it's, there's really not much to it, right? Like it's very simple image with a title and an image. But if you want to run it for across all these platforms, YouTube, Facebook, because YouTube, we can do static ads too, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, Twitch, Roblox is an option too. And you want to do it across all these different languages that we are active in. And we have different verticals too. So some people want to sell handcraft, some people want to sell apparel. So we want to have ads in the visual that speaks to each of them, but it's the same structure. 
that, and then you have all these different dimensions for each of the platforms and different video formats and lengths. And there's a lot that you can kind of get lost in. And with dimensions for the banner ads, usually you want to go for all the dimensions that nobody else is making ads for that are weird dimensions because there's less demand, more supply. So they end up being cheaper. So the real opportunity is there. You got to be able to produce all of these. So seven languages, six plus platform, let's say 25 dimensions, multiply by seven verticals. That's about 6,000 images for one creative idea. And it's not a fun process for any designer to sit around and change copy for seven languages, seven verticals over the same creative 6,000 times just to run for one piece of ad that we've got to refresh every week. And if it's a video, that's about 400 videos. So it's a lot of work. So figuring out how you do tooling, how you do processes to make sure one, it takes as little as time and it's as enjoyable as possible for people who are actually doing it is so important because that's how you really take something that worked and you spend so much time experimenting to do the learnings. You can scale that win all these different places and multiply it by all the languages and verticals that you can apply it to. Uh, so we use a lot of tooling. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each of them um, uh, to say, so one for, for example, we do a lot of uh, text animation and motion ads and uh, whoops uh, let me, um, there we go so for text usually you have the same type of text animation over and over again right like there's not that many ways you can animate text uh, especially when you're creating ads and for those every time we find a winning text format we have tooling that we turn it into a script we use after effects i know we have someone from adobe here phenomenal tool so make sure every win that you have that you are like okay this is the good pacing for the text this is a good in animation out animation we capture it as a script or a template so we don't have to keep doing it over and over again and that's why the first time takes the longest time the next time it's just a drag and drop and you can apply this to text animation image animation every time you make a video or even you know for static ads uh, for visuals, if it's illustrations and you have scenes that you want to have different okay, different uh, breakdowns, different uh, st uh, elements, you can create you know Figma templates that, that we have, for example, for this one, that you have all your elements and you can quickly iterate over it, change the scene instead of designing everything from scratch. So modularize all the pieces of creative that you have that anybody without that much design skills can also do it, which takes... Uh, away a lot of the boring tasks from designers and puts it in the hands of anybody on the team and the speed and now experimentation becomes cheaper too because it's not as uh, resource heavy to say hey i wonder what if we did it this way we did it that way uh, it's just another production color palettes you know we have our brand guidelines but within that we want to keep maximum flexibility to play around with colors because the color palette does make a big difference in terms of how much your ad stands out, what's the real uh, messaging to it, and you want to be able to experiment with different color palettes. So with Adobe After Effects, Adobe Photoshop, you can create schemes and uh, templates that you can quickly swap different palettes. So you know these are my background colors, these are my foreground colors, these are my primary text colors variations and secondary text colors, and then you can swap, switch between all of them very quickly regardless of what creative you have. Uh, for After Effects, we have a lot of tooling to get rid of um, keyframes because for animation and motion, keyframe is the most annoying thing. If you want to modify it, you have to time redo pretty much a good chunk of the animation. So there's a lot of tooling that helps you just do drag and drop scaling without worrying about animation. And every time we say, okay, we need bar charts a lot, we use it a lot uh, to show things, but Every time we want to animate bar charts, we have to keep animating all of it. Why not uh, create this tooling that allows us to just replace the size and it will just generate the bar charts by itself within seconds. So that's once you have a winning um, element, you can kind of spend the time to capture it as a tool, as a plugin. Then all the new designers you hire, they start with this uh, prepackaged template that they don't have to do it again. I think that's the other thing is like, since we hired so many designers, each of them had to reinvent the wheel every time they asked to design a motion for text or animation for a visualization like this. With this, we're like, we've already done the bar chart thing. Just use that, focus your energy on this new problem area we have instead of reinventing the wheel.
That makes so much sense. And it sounds like you just kind of built your own tooling because you know like what you repeatedly do. Exactly. And uh, the other thing that uh, I introduced was the creative management platform, which basically once you have, you know, you're these winning templates and uh, structures that you have, you're like, okay, I have this ad that works really well. We have an image on the right. We have the big title and a subtitle. We have our logo and the button. And each of these is an element. And with a creative management platform, you can capture this as a template, then create a Google sheet. And you say, okay, for each of the verticals and the languages, this is the image for English. This is the mm -hmm. headline, subheadline, call to action. For Dutch, this is the language. Th these are the variations for this vertical. For the other vertical, we have these images, and these are the uh, text for all the different languages. And since the template is the same, then it can just generate all of these. So we have four channels. We have seven languages with the same template. And after you set it all up, you can say the variations of the colors that you want. These are all the different color palettes that we use and all the sizes that we want for this campaign, which is nine sizes. And then it generates all the variations. So the designer doesn't have to do it one by one. Wow. And, it's, uh, and it's something that, you know, we work with SuperSide on this. And, you know, I think that's what makes SuperSide unique is that you actually very open to working with our tooling. So uh, a lot of times you come and build the templates and assets in our creative management platform, which is a game changer for us. Yeah. No, this is so, so cool. I mean, I think I, I, I think we haven't really seen, because like, you know, templates, when you use the word templates or AI even, it kind of has like a bad reputation because you get associated with, it, or it has been associated with cookie cutter, just churn some stuff out. But I love how you guys have married the art of experimentation and iteration with the scalability part and keeping things consistent. I mean, this is so well orchestrated. I have to say this, this is amazing. I'm telling you, you have a business here. <laughs> um, yes. there's, yeah. there's a couple of questions coming in. Uh, Erica Great. from the house is asking, uh, have you seen that can, this kind of consistency, which you often get through this kind of tooling and scale, does that play a part in effectiveness? Have you seen, like, let's say for advertising, whatever, have you seen it juice out more performance, for example? Yeah, definitely. You, you definitely take a compromise a lot of times on the efficiency. So usually your first version that you optimize for that platform is the best performing one. And once you scale it, it doesn't work just as well as the first one across all these languages and platforms, but it does perform better than any one-off you can make. Mm. So you still get a massive upside plus quantity by scaling it that way, but it wouldn't be just as good as the first one that got you super excited about it. But that's totally fine because now I have a very well-performing creative across all these languages and platforms that would be better than really focusing on like making one-offs. And the other good thing is, it, the, the other thing this gives you is a baseline to just have something that performs decently well in all these different use cases. Then you can say, okay, now things are happening. I can spend time to now improve individual areas better and say, okay, let's figure out the German ad and do a unique version of it for that. So a lot of the upside you get is to be able to scale good quality performance quickly across all these different surfaces. And then you have the time and not the worry uh, to really focus and improve incrementally all these different areas. Yeah, agreed. Uh, just very tactical, but like uh, Lindo Shamazi is asking, how do you guys, sort? he's basically asking, do you guys care about accessibility? What kind of, how does that play into the process? Like, is that a part of your decision-making? Yes. Yeah, so fortunately, Shopify has a great team uh, for accessibility. That, and so we have a system where we share a lot of the creatives we're about to launch. They review it. We have a localization team that reviews all the assets because that's one of the hardest things I've done, especially when you translate English to German also. That really messes up our sizing. It's much longer stuff. Um, so we have a couple of different teams that specialize in all these different areas that are partners as well, and they have a passive review system. So we have all these assets available to them. They review it if there's anything that would flag it, otherwise we launch it. Gotcha. Amazing. Uh, one more question. No name here. This person's called no hands. Okay. <laughs> I hope you have hands. 
<laughs> um, he or she is asking, how do you typically measure success of each campaign? Uh, which in your in the Shopify life um, have you seen like consistently um, uh, is the most important for you guys? Is it reach or is it something else or, or is it diff- different based on the campaign that you're working on? It's never reach. That, that because reach you can just have a blank screen and spend money on it and it will get reach that's the function of all the platforms like advertising platforms is as long as you pay them money they will show your ad uh they might show it charge you a little bit more or less based on how engaging it is but at the end of the day it's more correlated with your spend than anything else but anything after reach those can be individual uh, optimizations that we focus on but the real outcome that we look for is the objective so for a lot of our campaigns, it's cost per click, and that's where we hold the creative most responsible for. And that, that's something you have to figure out is how far in the funnel is it fair to hold the creative responsible for? Where does the creative make the most difference? Because of course, the creative can make a difference in on-site actions, but is it the biggest driver or not? If it is, then that becomes your objective. If your creative is really the biggest lever to get people off platform to your site, then that's the cost of that, taking someone from platform to site becomes the objective of the campaign. Then we break it down into all the different steps of the funnel before that. So reach to view, view to retention, retention to click, click to landing page uh, action. Yeah. 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 Amazing. This has been so educational. Thank you so much, Amir. And and folks, whoever's listening in, I mean, I learned a lot. I'm sure you all have some really great takeaways. We're running like a tiny little contest. So if you if you've got a great insight that you learned from Amir or from Adam in the previous session, and of course the upcoming session, if you learn something cool, if you post it on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, wherever it is. Uh, and tag Superside and tag the speaker, that would be amazing. And you would get not only Superside swag, but also a copy of Adam Morgan's book. Uh, So hopefully we'll see you on one of those channels. And Amir, thank you again. Uh, Where can people find you? Uh, On Twitter, Amir Jafari is probably the best place. You can also email me, jafari.amir at Gmail. Uh, But yeah. Thank you so much. Anytime. Uh, Thank you so much. We'll take a five minute break because this has been a long session. Uh, We'll see you back in five minutes. And in the meantime, hopefully we'll see you on Instar LinkedIn. Cool. Bye.